Good evening. I'm Stan Bilecki. I've been a member of the Tea Party since 2009. I've been in the Act Candidate Action Committee since then, since the first meeting we ever had. The Candidate Action Committee's focus is to bring candidates to the Tea Party so that we have an opportunity as a group to question them, to uh, kind of vet them. But I would ask also that, in addition, everybody should understand that a candidate is running, and they, when the candidate is running, they need help, either financially, if you can do it, or personally. Best case scenario, Talk to your neighbors. If you see a candidate during one of our debates or our forums that you really are impressed with, talk to your neighbors and see, tell them what you think of this candidate. That would be a great help for them. Most candidates have yard signs. Now, most of us don't like yard signs, but we don't mind them if they're in the yard. We just don't like them on the roads. Uh, Okay, to continue from here, we have, I don't know if Doc Morley is here? No. Okay, we have two candidates here that are running for the uh, 17th Congressional District, which includes most of Bethlehem. It goes all the way up to Skoga County. We have Matt Conley and Matthew Dietz here. I wish them to both come up. I'm going to ask each one of them to tell you a little, take about a couple minutes to tell you about themselves, why they're running, where they're from, a little bit about their background, and why they think they should be candidates. And then we're going to open it up. This is a forum and not a debate, so we're going to open it up to questions from the floor. Now, I would ask that when you ask a question, you make it specific to a candidate so that we can move this thing along and we can get a lot more questions in. First, uh, Matt Conley. Thank you, Stan. My name is Matt Conley. I'm running for the 17th District Congress. Uh, I first found out about the Tea Party in 2010. Well, I found out about it when it became first popular in 09. Heard about it on the radio, saw the rallies, didn't know how to get involved. 2010, I'm running for State Senate against um, Lisa, don't throw me out of the bar, Boscola. Um, and, you know, it was, it was my first foray into politics. I felt compelled to do something. I didn't, I'm not a complainer. I like to try to affect change. And I was knocking on doors. And the gentleman there, could you please stand up? I'm knocking on his door to get a signature because he's registered Republican. And I see the Tea Party thing and the 912. And I'm like, finally, I meet somebody who... What, where, can, where, can, where can I go? He says, oh, come to the Shrin Center, you know, Friday, first Friday every, every month, blah, blah, blah. So we have to thank him for, for recruiting another member. Um, give background about myself. Uh, I came to Lehigh Valley in 1989. Uh, my goal, dream in life, since I was six years old, was to drive race cars professionally. And I started off, like most kids, doing whatever I could. Uh, didn't come from much as far as family background, so I had to earn everything. And I ended up winning a championship after I drove for a team, and I worked the entire year for this team before, in 1988, in order I can drive a car, one of their race cars in 1989. I won the championship, and with that momentum, I was able to form a team with a partner up here in Easton. I've come to Lehigh Valley then, and never left. Since then, I've started um, a fairly successful professional auto racing team, but I've never forgotten that it was the American dream that's allowed me to do what I wanted to do. I knew growing up, and I've always had this very deep patriotic sense, that the only thing that keeps you from succeeding in life is you. It's not something else, you're not a victim, and the government certainly shouldn't have a role. And that was part of... And, and that was part of what was always something I've noticed that's changed. When we were younger, when I, we, hey, I'm 48 years old, right? I'm not exactly the youngest guy here. Um, and I remember thinking about the government, it was always in a box somewhere. It was in a box, and I remember learning about the checks and balances and the Constitution. It was so brilliantly designed, and isn't this great? We can, we're free, we can do whatever we want. 
That started to change. It started to change a little bit uh, under Clinton, a whole lot more under Obama, until the point now I realize the American dream is in, is in real trouble. Uh, and I think that's by design. So that was when I decided to step up to the plate in 2014 and run for Congress. So my, my platform is Renew the American Dream. Uh, I think the, what the Tea Party is going to do for this country is it's going to save it, personally. When you have an organization like the Tea Party, and there's no one single leader, and you have grassroots people getting together who understand that our liberties and rights come from God, not from the government, that's very important, and also that if one person or two people or three people start talking, the network begins and here we are. So I think that's, that's something that we should never forget. It, you don't need a majority to have a majority. You need to act like you have a majority because the left tries to do that to us as was brilliantly shown in that, in that Second Amendment slide before. So finish up. I guess I'm getting the hook here, Stan, huh? Okay, gentle hook from Stan Balecki. Um, that's my platform. I look forward to your questions. Now we have Matt Carl, or uh, Matt Dates. Matt? Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for in inviting me here. Uh, just a little background for me. I'm, I'm from Wingap, Pennsylvania, husband, father of three children. And it's the three children, which I have my oldest son here, are the reason why I decided to enter this race. Uh, obviously, that this country is on an unsustainable path of spending and debt. And, and there's really two choices. We can sit back and watch this function of, of Washington or we can uh, step in and try and do something. And that's what I decided to do. Um, my wife and I are, are both leaders in our church's youth group. And uh, you know, and that's where I wear this from, is when the church asked us to step in and asked if we would commit to uh, helping the youth. And that's really why I'm, I'm going ahead and, and running for Congress here. It's you know, help my children and the entire next generation. You know, we, we had a lot of privileges and opportunities you know, growing up. I was able to work through school and, and, and college and, and through flight training to earn my degree as a professional pilot and, and continue my dream. Now, children come out of school with tens of thousands of dollars of student loan debt and, and come out to a struggling job market. And it doesn't need to be that way. You know, Pennsylvania is blessed with a lot of resources. Uh, we, we can have a, a great growing economy around the energy sector. And, uh, you know, it's the EPA and, and the government overall is, is stepping in. And the Second Amendment, like you said, is it, just the, the first step of it. And, and we really need to, to fight back with it. Um, it. It wasn't too long ago that, that I, my household became a, uh, you know, gun ownership. My wife was uncomfortable with it prior to that because she had been raised around guns. And I really think that's going to be the first step of educating people and getting them around it is, and I know the NRA and stuff does that, it, is really putting programs out here to the, to the schools and to the younger children. So many of them are, are afraid of guns just because of, you know, as farms have dwindled off, as gun ownerships have dwindled down a little bit, it's, uh, you know, they just fear them, mostly because they don't understand them. And that's how a lot of the left people that are able to get support is just from people not knowing about guns. So if we can really educate them, we'll really get people to swing over and protect the, the Second Amendment, and which will, again, protect the rest of our rights going forward. So like everyone said, you know, I would uh, appreciate your help with the candidacy, and, you know, whether it's knocking on doors, uh, putting a yard sign in, or, or contributing as well. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you, man. All right, now we're going to open it up for questions. Does anybody have a question? Janice, please, for who? Hold on. Janice, he's going to come around with the mic for you. <laughs> I would like to ask both of you, Common Core, where do you stand? And the second part is, if a company like Exxon says, we're leaving your state if you drop us, where are you going to stand? Okay, to clarify, if a company like what says they're going to leave our state? Exxon, Exxon the gas station? I'm, f I'm against Common Core. I'm against any top-down uh, government control. I think the best government is always local government. And if Exxon wants to leave, then let them. Come on, this is freedom, right? I, I agree. I'll see you against Common Core. You know, all these government one-size-fits-all policies are failing not only here in Pennsylvania, but all across the United States. And uh, we, we do. We need to turn the power back to the states and back to the local communities on, on how to best educate their children. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to allow my one son goes to the Lehigh Valley Academy because it, it's, uh, he, he would be in the Bethlehem School District, but it gives him a different opportunity, a different type of education system that works for him. My other son does better in the structured system, but we need to give choice to the parents, you know, for, for how to educate our, our children. And uh, yeah, again, Exxon could leave. You know, it's a, a free market. And the reality is, well, let's uh, 
get our taxes and regulations in order and we'll have another company, a Pennsylvania born company, take its place. All right, Ronnie. I have a question for Matt Connolly. Matt, I'm going to start by saying um, thank you for being a member of the Tea Party. And I also understand and hope that you understand that as a member of the Tea Party, we're going to hold you to a higher standard. Are you okay with that? I'm with you. All right. Here we go. I did a little research this morning because Matthew Cartwright has a war chest of about $400,000 already. It's only the fifth month of the year. Going into this campaign in the fall, we're going to need a lot of money to combat it. So I looked up the finance reports of uh, Dr. Moylan, Matt Deese, and Matt Connolly, and Cartwright. And I noticed that uh, Matt Connolly doesn't have any report filed. So I called the FEC to ask why. There are two reasons why a candidate doesn't file. It's because, one, they either haven't met the $5,000 of donations and spending that requires a file, or they just haven't done it. In Matt's case, we found out that on April 21st, let me check my date, he did file a notice that they did not meet the $5,000 requirement yet in his campaign. Um, and that's why there's no report filed. So he's not breaking any laws, but he's not raising any money either. So my question to you is, expecting a higher standard from Tea Party members with less than $5,000, how do you plan on beating a gentleman that has a war chest of already 400000 Well, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the research. Uh, I have a lot more than $5,000. I didn't have it then and I didn't have to file. There's no reason giving, if you want to go under the radar with a guy like Cartwright, have him think you're not a threat, that's exactly how you do it. Okay, it's, it's really that simple. I, I've, had, I've worked in the ra auto racing industry. I've got donors lined up to max out all across the country. It's that simple. I, this, it's, I guarantee you one thing though, I'm not gonna raise more than Mount Cartwright because the guy put $390,000 of his own money to beat Tim Holden in the primary. He's got the unions, he's got the trials. You don't have to outraise a guy like that to beat him. You just have to raise enough money to beat him. And I can definitely do that. How can you guarantee that when you're saying that you're not going to tell anybody what you're doing? We really like transparency here. I understand that. After, I think, what is it, May, a few days from now, I have to start showing what I've got, which is fine. It was a simple, it was a simple decision that I made not to show what I had. To, what I had in April 21st. Moylan's got 900 bucks, and I think, Matt, what do you have, 9,000 or something like that? A okay, a little more than that. The, the, the couple thousand bucks isn't gonna make a difference. Uh, and I, you know, we can split hairs here. I think there's more important issues to talk about, but um, that, believe me, that's not gonna be an issue. Uh, if you really wanna get down to it, you might wanna ask the other two candidates, how are they gonna run full time when they both have to work for a living, whereas my situation is, I don't have to work for a living. I work for myself. My schedule is very flexible. I've got any day off I want throughout the rest of the year, and I think that's probably a lot more important when it comes to knocking on doors and going to forums and meeting people than if you've got $400,000, $4,000, or $9,000 in the bank. Just to be fair, uh, the report I have says that Matt Dietz had 22,937 as of the 31st, and Doc Moylan had 11,943. Yeah, well, Doc, the last form, he just said he now has 900, so Thank you. things change. <laughs> I could stay in here and watch you jumping up and down all day. <laughs> Joan, please. I would actually like to hear Matt's um, answer to that. And the, the short answer is, I will be able to run for this campaign full time up and through November. Um, it is going to be difficult. That's why I started last summer because it is six counties to go out and start knocking on doors. You know, getting a grassroots base out there to go ahead and go forward. Now, fortunately, the, the employers that I work for have been very supportive of this campaign. Uh, working up to this point, they're also very uh, into the Tea Party and all that stuff, and, and supporting our troops and everything else. And they're they're very much behind the the, uh, the campaign going forward. First of all, my job itself slows down in the summertime, so from now till July, we don't do, or August rather, we don't do much flying anyway, and I'm able to be selective on what trips I take to make sure I'm able to make events like this, and you know, do our fundraising events, and, and go out and, and do door to door, and uh, I will be able to take some vacation time at the end of it, and for a month or so, I'll be unemployed, but it's all worth it. Randy Toman. 
Uh, the question really is for both of them, if they wouldn't mind commenting on it. The trust factor for the politicians down in D.C. is probably as low as it's ever been in history. Uh, one of the problems that we always have is that there's no, there's no recourse for the Tea Party once the guy goes off the tracks. Why should we trust you to? Well, well, first of all, Randy, you don't have a whole lot of options. <laughs> but uh, there, you know, running for office is a is a, is a pretty serious thing. Um, I'm I don't need to run for office. I'm choosing to because I'm seeing the country that I grew up in and that I love so much change and change in a way that is not something that I thought, oh, that's the pendulum swinging one way or the other. My, my older brother voted for Obama, you know, he's still a nice guy, but, uh, and I was talking, I said, why did you do that? He said, oh, you know, you know, it goes this way, then it goes this way, and I said, no, Paul, the pendulum swings to the left, and then it goes to the left more, and then sometimes it comes back slightly to the right, and then it goes to the left even more. I said, it's not, it's not like it's swinging across the center, which everyone thinks it is, and the mainstream media likes to say, oh, no, it's, it's center, center, center. It's not. We are a center-right country. The Tea Party represents more people than it does not represent, and that's really important. I, I'm not going to go down there because I want to get comfortable like the other guys that go down there who start off with these great ideals. It means some, my integrity means more to me than being called congressman. I don't think there's anything more to say than that. This past Sunday actually was one of our uh, bi-weekly youth groups that we have. And uh, I take over for the, the high school group and we actually met at the Panera right down the road from there. And actually the, the very topic that we had with, with students or the, the, uh, the high school students was trust, you know, and based on, you know, who do you get your trust from and, and what do you use to, to, to gain that trust? And is it in a person or like monetary? And, um, you know, I stand by trust, you know, and, and I realize it's something hard to earn, but it's easy to lose. And I'm running for my children, and, you know, again, it's the, uh, the church that holds me accountable for to it. I'm only running for three terms, so I can go ahead and, and make the hard decisions and get back to, run, you know, my, my career as flying airplanes and get back to my family. And uh, I don't want to spend any time down here in Washington that I don't need to. You know, unfortunately here in Pennsylvania, I'll be able to drive down on Mondays, and when they get done on Wednesday or Thursday, I'm going to drive home, which means I'll spend more time with my family, more time with the constituents instead of down in Washington. You know, a successful, uh, you know, career, if you want to call it that, in Washington would be anyone outside of the 17th district doesn't know who I am. I'm not on there to get on the news or get on there and, and you know, make noise. But if we can go ahead and get America back on the right track, and it's the people of the 17th district that know who I am, then I'm happy. Uh, this question is for both guys. If you are elected, what is your stance on immigration? Well, I assume you mean illegal immigration? Okay. First word is the most important, illegal. Um, the first thing we have to do before anything is decided, secure the border. Because it's a game they play. We all realize the Democrats want a lot of potential Democratic voters coming in, and they love the cheap labor. The Republicans, in a lot of ways, aren't much better. They love the cheap labor. They, don't, they realize, I think it's a 70-30 split. 70% will probably become Democrats and 30% Republicans. So the first thing you have to do is if you're going to enact anything, the border must be secured and it must be proven to be secured. You cannot have that as part of a package deal because it'll be real simple. It's like what they do all the time. They make this great big law, this total reform, and then the part that really matters, like securing the border, that gets dropped off. That no longer gets enforced. Is there anyone here who can honestly trust this administration to enforce anything? No, of course not. So anything as far as immigration, right now the problem with immigration in the first place is that a lot of the people who come, let's just use Mexico as an example, they don't want to be citizens like they used to. 20, 30 years ago, they wanted to be citizens, now they don't. Maybe, maybe they're seeing something we haven't yet. But what they do is they come up, they earn money, they send it back. So there's a tremendous influx over, you know, to and from the border. If we had a properly secured border, they would be able to leave, it would be a one-way valve. They'd be able to leave, but they wouldn't be able to come back. Because what they do is they lower the value of everyone else's labor. How can we have all these illegal immigrants get all these people on welfare, and yet they claim there are jobs that Americans won't do? I'm sorry, there is no job that is beneath anybody, especially when you're on welfare. So until we can secure the border, 
there's no need to talk about what we do about the folks who are here because that's the problem we take care of after we take care of the first problem. You know, when the boat's sinking, you plug the hole and then you worry about how to get rid of the water, that kind of thing. I agree that the very first thing we need to do is secure the border. And obviously that is from the immigration standpoint, we need to know who's coming in and who's leaving, but also on a national security standpoint. You know, it wasn't that long ago that, that a truck got hijacked down in Mexico that was carrying uh, the, the chemotherapy medicine that was on it. Now, as it turns out, I guess it was just, it was just hijacked just because they hijacked the truck. But that very well easily could have been hijacked and, and turned into some kind of mass weapon and, and brought back up to the border. So we need to secure our borders so we can figure out who's coming in, who's going out. And like I said, that, that needs to be a, a standalone bill because all the rest of it, they don't continue on with. So before we can go on with anything else, we need to secure the borders. And we can do that by limiting our enrollment, our military enrollment overseas. Get them back here to the United States, base them down along the border, you know, and, and if we can have these bases down there that keeps the, the revenue here in the United States, you know, and, and if we have, uh, you know, Apaches running up and down the, the uh, coast doing some training, stuff like that down the border, I think that would deter a lot of them from trying to sneak across. Yes. For both gentlemen, other than Obamacare, which federal programs would you favor repealing and not replacing? <laughs> well, if I could amend that uh, question slightly, I don't think we should replace Obamacare because see, I think what we have to learn as a citizenry, we have to learn how to reject the premise that big government is the answer. Um, you, you talked about, um, yeah, you can clap for that. Heck, I, I'm for it too. No, that, that's the thing. With, in Washington, what happens is they create all these problems. And by the way, the whole health care issue is based on a problem they created in World War II when they imposed wage caps. But that's a whole other discussion. But for them to say we have to repeal and replace, that's the media trying to get on the side of, of, of the left, of the Democrats, to say, well, what's your, what's your solution? Our solution is the, is the free market. What's going to drive down prices better than free market competition? Oh, and by the way, why wasn't tort reform in Obamacare? Right, it's, a, it's the question that answers itself. It's because the trial lawyers are the biggest single contributors to the Democratic Party, and God forbid they don't want to uh, let anyone else take you know, money out of their pocket. And to, to go one step further, our hero, Matt Cartwright, who, who we're going to take down this fall, he voted for a bill to re increase the uh, liability for truckers from $750,000 to $4.2 million in liability. Now, why would they do that? Because it's a bigger piece of the pie they get when they go sue some guy who's doing his best, trying to feed his family, and has an accident. I mean, these are the things that we have to really understand, because these are the things that are going to impact our lives. But getting back to your question about what would, you, what would I repeal, I, there's so many. Uh, I, nothing, I mean, the Keystone XL pipeline decision, I would change that decision, obviously. Um, I, I think, I think there's, there's so many laws. I, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss when you've got so much to choose from, but um, I think we ought to change. Oh, I know what I'd change. Um, the welfare to work program, which was done thanks to Newt Gingrich, even though Clinton vetoed it twice, then Obama took the work um, requirement out of it. I, I'd repeal that one. First, let me hit on my plan for the Affordable Care Act. So firstly, if it comes to vote, yes, I would fully support the re repeal of it. Uh, unfortunately, the way it works is even if we, get, we win the, uh, the Senate this time around, we're not going to have enough votes to be able to you know, put it for repeal and get it past a presidential veto and get back in. What I want to put forward is legislation that allows states to opt out of the Affordable Act. Put the, you know, put the control back into the states. Let states address the situations like tort reform, allow individuals to buy tax you know, uh, policies you know, across the borders for open up competition, allow individuals to buy insurance policies with pre-tax dollars, so it levels the fields of, of companies and individuals buying taxes, or buying insurance policies, rather. Um, and, and the second part is, and let the, the states get rid of the, the employer mandate part, and that'll not only lower the cost of the healthcare, but also open up the job market, so we have more people working, more people to get in, insurance plans. Um, as for the, what else I get rid of is the, the, the overbearing uh, freedom of the EPA. You know, when they go after not only our, our big companies that, that, that are uh, trending us from, you know, creating domestic energy policies, but when they're also going after individual homeowners because that they have a wood burning stove that doesn't meet their energy efficiencies, you know, in, in a time when people are struggling to put gas in their car and heat their homes, you know, it's, uh, they're growing a little bit too big.
With regard to the illegal situation, I don't know if everybody's thinking about the fact that we have that problem in every state, not just the border states. Because people fly in now and they come in on boats and move across the country with freedom. Uh, my cousin just lost a job to a guy from India. She was making $50,000 for the job. They're paying him 25 for the same job. So uh, it, it affects all of us, all the illegal stuff in, in all the states. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Give me that. 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 You, I, I'm from the 15th district. You both seem very nice. <laughs> one of you has to lose. Could one of you please move to the 15th district? <laughs> This is for no, both maps. With three of you running, you must, uh, this, I want your opinion on this. All three of you have got to take care not to attack each other. Your focus has got to be caught right, okay? And if you're going to find a progressive puppets from the press, I'm going to try to trip you up. You're going to be asked trick questions. You've got to make up your mind that one of the three of you has to win and then you have to knock off Cartwright. Do you or not agree with me? No attacking each other, like in the last circus we had in the presidential election with the nine of them, you had nine clowns on the stage. And you know, you like you wanted to hide your head in shame. Okay, so that's my question. Can you assure us? I can, and uh, I, I agree with you. And my wife knows I'm committed in this election until November, whether I'm the nominee after May 20th or not. And, and it's going to take all three of us working together to, to get Cartwright out of there. Obviously, I wouldn't be running if I didn't think I was the, the, the candidate to go for it. But I am committed to go on through November and uh, make sure that we, we you know, take the seat back. Yeah, it's funny. This, this came up when we all, all three of us were down, and Doc isn't here. Um, but all three of us were in Hershey when we first met the NECRA, which is the Northeast uh, Caucus Republicans. Uh, and they asked us the question as well. Uh, you know, the thing is, there's, there's more similarities we have than there are differences. It really comes down to, and part of the reason we're having these forums is, who do, who do people think can win? In a debate against Cartwright, who can beat the guy? There's no great policy differences between any of us. It, it's just a matter of who can, who can carry the message, and I'll, I'll agree with Matt on. Um, I worked for Laureen Cummings when she ran against Cartwright in 2012. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I'm running is, and she's not, is after meeting me, she said, you know what, I'd rather have you up there, Matt, than, than her, than she. Um, so I will support the nominee, whoever. And by the way, to speak for Doc, uh, when this came up, he not only agreed with what we said, but he said, and I guarantee I'll deliver Schuylkill County for you. So it's all good. We're, we're in good shape. I have the microphone again. Yes, John. Yeah, no. I have a question for Matt 1 and Matt 2. <laughs> kind of like thing 1 thing 2 you can figure out. Um, what steps, if you would get into office, would you take to prevent the current scandals like Benghazi, the IRS scandals? What other scandal like this? Fast and Fast and Fast and yeah. what, what? Pick, pick one. Pick, exactly. They're saying pick it. What would you guys do to prevent things from coming or happening? Happening. Set up IRS. Well, if you're not involved in them, there's really not much you can do. Um, there's, you know, the, these are. If you look at the causes of all these things, it's based on the agenda of the person who committed it. Uh, with, with Obama, there's always a, a secondary, he, the guy can never be honest about what he really believes in. Fast and Furious was simple. We all realized that they put a bunch of guns into Mexico so they could use it to try to restrict our gun laws by showing us how dangerous they are. Okay, that's, and, and, and that scandal, <laughs> frankly, hasn't, hasn't even come to a full pass yet. The IRS thing, once again, it's their agenda, trying to, trying to restrict folks like the Tea Party from doing what they're going to do. Uh, all we can do, or all I can do as your next congressman, 
is to make sure that I'm in no part of those things. And you have to have that gut check. You know, if, if it doesn't smell right, it probably is and you should probably get away from it. Other than that, people are going to do what they're going to do. I mean, crooks in Washington are certainly nothing new. So the first thing to do is obviously, if I get in there, is to be honest with you guys and let you know what's going on down there in Washington. And keep you guys informed and keep groups like this going and hold not only us, but every other candidate and every other level accountable and bring this message to the Democrats as well. You know, as for the IRS, we, we can limit their ability to, uh, you know, pass judgment by simplifying the tax code, you know, lower the tax rates and eliminate the loopholes and only benefit the few, and then take the personal objectiveness out of it, make it a simple policy, and then they can't be selective on, on who they want to go after. We actually have a follow-up to that one. Yeah, I have, I have a question. Um, everyone sounds great when they're, you know, running, and you, I like what both of you have to say, and you may have sort of answered this just a few minutes ago, but as far as policies or issues, are there any other contrasts between the two of you, and you both, of course, can answer that. Any contrasts or differences as far as policies or issues go? Not that I know of, really. <laughs> I have a similar follow-up question to the one that was asked two, two uh, questions ago. Since you're both running for Congress, and we've seen the abuses that take place with the current administration, and uh, as an example, the Clive Bundy situation with the Bureau of Land Management in Nevada, what do you believe that these departments like Bureau of Land Management, the IRS, Department of Commerce, they're, they're all been militarized and have their SWAT teams, including the Department of Education. Do you believe that's proper and should they be disarmed? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Thomas Jefferson said it best, and I'm going to quote something I see on Gordon Santee's sweatshirt every baseball game, because he's on our team. It's a, it's a quote from Thomas Jefferson that says, when the people, when the government fears its people, there is freedom. When the people fear their government, there's tyranny. And there's a reason why those people are always armed, because they know that there's 100 million people in America who are gun owners. So they've got to make sure they're packing heat and they have to make sure everything that happens to them is a felony with all sorts of incredible uh, penalties and punishments. So yeah, we, 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 have to make the, we have to remind the government and those departments that they work for us. They serve us. It's not about the power grab. And what I think the cause of a lot of this is, and this is a funny thing about human nature, all the radicals from the 60s, they read Saul Linsky's book and they realized you have to work within the system. And they've all come into government, they've come into academia, into judgeships, things like that. So that's the real enemy. And, and our founding fathers were brilliant enough, because I really believe in so many ways the founding fathers got it right, that we have to defend against domestic terrorism, but, excuse me, against uh, enemies both foreign and domestic. And it's very, very telling that they put domestic in there because they saw how in Europe and the places they were from, how the internal people within the countries could circumvent their own government, and they want to make sure that we didn't have that situation here. Hi. Um, I have an equally important question about just job safety. What are your plans to bring the jobs back from China, India, Japan, and Saudi Arabia, which are equally important to us, and they're all flying away with corporations? There is no cap in corporations right now. And my second question would be the hate speech that was introduced yesterday. How are you planning to repeal that if it gets to pass in Congress? Well, the first thing to do to keep these jobs back here, obviously, is to fix our, our corporate tax code and tax structure. So these companies can compete here in the United States. You know, unfortunately, it's not a level playing field across the world. You know, it's, uh, they pay way less in wages, that they, they pollute the environment. So they don't have the same standards and the same costs we do. But we need to fix the tax structure so that these companies can stay and keep the profits here in the United States. And we need to do it fast. So if another country is able to lure our, our big companies over there because their corporate tax rate is 25%, they'll not move back here if we just match their 25%. We need to get below it to lure them back here. So we need to act fast because once these companies are gone, we're not going to get them back. So we need to fix the tax code, you know, again, simplify it, eliminate the loopholes so that we can keep them here, lure some of them back, but also encourage startup business, you know, and that's where the entrepreneur comes in. But right now, there's, you know, 
rifled with, with you know tax policies and, and red tape that they can't start a company or expand or grow. We need to simplify it so the companies that, or individuals here that want to start and grow a company can, and we need to keep the companies that are here from leaving and, and see what we can to get these companies back over here. Okay, um, you know, remember when John Kerry was running in, in 2004 and he had the big buzzword was outsourced and Kerry Bush outsourced, we're gonna outsource this. Well, it really isn't outsourcing when the government makes compliance with laws virtually impossible. Could you imagine if you wanted to start up a factory in Northampton County? The amount of rules, regulations, the, the environmental studies, everything would be cost prohibitive. So what do they do? They, I mean, businesses have to survive. They're not like the government. They can't print their own money or borrow it from China or wherever else. So what do they do? They say, okay, we're going to go to Mexico, we're going to go to China, possibly Canada, we're going to go to all these kind of places who are welcoming the technology that we export. So they actually get a, like a three for one deal. They get, they get great technology that we develop. They get a skilled workforce that will train their people here and then send the jobs over there. And then they have a compliant uh, regulatory system that keeps those businesses going. So then the companies, which a lot of them do, they have branch offices and branch satellite uh, uh, corporations in these different companies. Remember GE made $5 billion the other year, didn't pay any taxes? Well, then the government says, oh, those, those darn American companies, greedy American companies, they've got trillions of cash on their books and they've got trillions overseas and they're not bringing any of it here. Well, when you're going to lose 35% of something just for bringing it over this border, would you do it? I mean, they're doing it for their own survival and it's really too bad. The leftists aren't realizing that they are creating the job trans, trans, transformation to other countries by their own rules, yet they try to say they're doing it to help us. It, 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 they don't have the common sense, they don't have the business degrees, they don't have the experience to understand that, that the law of unintended consequences is really big, especially when you make the laws. That's why we need good people in there to counteract those laws. Uh, this is for both gentlemen. Are you in favor of a flat tax? And if not, do you have a plan of your own? And uh, a separate question for Matt Connolly. Since you have been in politics a while, and uh, against during the presidential, what time and how did you volunteer for Mitt Romney? Okay, the uh, first question about the flat tax. Uh, you know how they like to talk about everyone paying their fair share? Well, if a good percentage of the country doesn't pay anything, I don't see where the fair share is. So I believe there should be a flat tax. I think everybody should pay something. That, that's, it's, called, it's called having skin in the game. You can't really complain about stuff if you don't have any, any affair in it. Um, what did I do for Mitt Romney? I, I worked phones. I made phone calls from the phone banks. Um, I put out signs. Um, I did a bunch of mail, uh, envelope stuffing, things like that. Is, is, that, is that okay? Thanks. <laughs> I would support a, a fair tax, but mostly what I want to push for is, is keeping a, a lot of the same structure we have now, but lower the tax rates for everybody, eliminate the loopholes that only benefit the few, which will entice a, you know, or, or encourage you know, more revenue through a, a broader base. Um, and that's, I think that's the, the way to go. Now also, I just like, let it clear that I also I did help with the, the Mitt Romney campaign as well, and worked over on Chandlersville Road at the, the Victory uh, Center there. Um, and I did that through flying Pat Toomey around and getting connected and, you know, they were very supportive and connected me even with my campaign here. So they, uh, you know, they're the ones that connected me and, and helped me so I, I can get involved and, and, you know, learn how the system worked and, you know, prepare me. Yes, sir. You all believe in term limits. Do you believe in term limits? I do. Uh, I do believe in term limits. I, I love the concept of throw the bums out. Um, but what really happens oftentimes is there's a little bit of automatic term limiting every 10 years when we have the redistricting based on the census. That's why a lot of, that's why Cartwright's in now. Tim Holden was there for 10 terms, 20 years, okay, a long time. Uh, they redistrict, they add Scranton onto the top of the 17th district. Well, Matt Cartwright, uh, you know, has the, the law firm Monley, Monley and Cartwright up there. So we had name recognition. He beat um, Holden in the primary, otherwise Holden would have been there forever. Um, mandatory term limits, you know, I'm kind of torn. Um, sometimes people can be really good at something. And should they, should they be kicked out? 
you know, it, I, I know where you're coming from. I'm glad the presidency has term limits for a very important reason. That's a lot of power in one person and a lot of cabinet positions. And sometimes that can be so great as to be very hard to undo that dynasty. When it comes to congressmen and senators, I think the ballot box is the best, uh, is the best term limit, but I would not be opposed if someone came up with a good concept for term limits. But the problem is there's no way it would ever get passed because who, who in the government would ever vote unless they gave themselves, um, you know, grandfathered themselves in. I would vote for a term limit, that's for sure, but I, I'd, I'd like to see how it was written down because it, it could not take effect for 50 years the way they would do it. Yeah, Ronnie? Just make the pledge. You pledge that you're not going to run for more than three terms like Pat Toomey did. I'm not going to make that pledge. Okay. <laughs> I have made that pledge and would stick to it, and yes, there should be term limits. We have a lot of, we have a lot of good you know, college and teenage Republicans that are involved in politics right now. I know we have some in the room here that if I was fortunate enough to get in and serve all three terms, in six years, they're going to be right for, for that position and ready to take anyone on, and you know, so on and so forth. You know, and especially the, the young guys we have now, it's they're the ones that are inheriting this debt and everything that's going forward. You know, they deserve a chance to get in office and, and fight back and, and you know, get America back. Yeah. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been around since 1913. What do you know, and this is for you, Matt, to go first, if you don't mind. Uh, let me ask the question. What do you know about the Federal Reserve? We are trillions of dollars in debt. The, the, the derivative markets, some estimate as high as 600 to 700 trillion dollars. It's globally. We got QE to nothing. They took all the money away from all the common person that has in the savings accounts. There's no interest in any kind of account. What would you, how would you take on the money people at the Federal Reserve? That's got to change. I agree, and, and the, the first thing is, uh, I'm sure you guys are all aware, the, the Simpson-Bowles plan. Uh, I, I've read it, and I've actually t talked to, to Mr. Simpson, and, and I support it. You know, that, that's a great way. We need to really address the, the financial path that the country's on right now. And, you know, too many politicians in Washington have just been, you know, biting their tongue and, and kicking the can going down forward. We need someone who's going to be honest with the American people and, and like you said, say, you know, what bad shape we're in. And the worst thing we can do right now is do nothing. You know, every year we wait and, and don't fix it. The, the problem grows and grows. You know, what I think they should have is like, you know, when you, you, you purchase a home and, and they have that, that truth in lending on there that shows, you know, how much you're paying for the house and if you make all the payments, that's what it is. Well, that's what they should do with the bills and, and budgets that we pass now because we're borrowing so much of it to, to get going forward. They say, well, this is what, it, you know, we're, we're paying, you know, three trillion right now, but we only have a million, trillion and a half of it. So this is really what it's going to cost us going forward. And, and it's, again, it, it's my children, the next generation that, that's going to be, you know, held up this debt. And, you know, just like Social Security and going forward, we knew this was going to be a problem, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And instead of making minor corrections then, you know, doing means testing and, and, and doing little adjustments, A, keeping the money in there that, that everyone's paying into it, and instead of robbing it for every little pet project that they want to have going forward. But the, the, the problem is they've ignored it, you know, and, and now instead of little minor cuts and, and, and little minor adjustments to get us back on track, it, they're going to be ugly cuts, you know, and, and it's going to look bad, you know. And, and I think, uh, you know, one on a local example of it is uh, locally, and, and I applaud Hayden for this, was and I, I went to school in Paragel, so the We Own a Park thing is, you know, I, I love going there after school and hanging out, and, uh, and I serve on the park board in Wingap where I'm at, and, and I understand, you know, there's a great asset to the open space grant programs that are out there, but at a time when the county is struggling for money, those are programs that don't need to be funded right now. And so that, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with it, there was the, uh, the miniature golf course that they're trying to renovate, and it's gonna cost $80,000, I think it is, uh, uh, for the, uh, the county to, to renovate it. We could do it on a local level. You know, instead of in high school when I did the mechanical drawing of just nonsense pictures, let's let them go ahead and plan it out. Let's get the local Boy Scouts in there to, to build it in. Let's get the community around it so it doesn't, you know, burden our taxes and, and build up to it. And if the community's involved with it, they're more likely to be, you know, visit it and contribute to it and, you know, keep it existing going forward. And it's going to take a lot of tough choices like that to get America on the right track. But we can do it. The longer we wait, the harder it's going to get. Randy, do you want me to answer the question about the Fed? Okay, uh, Federal Reserve, I believe, was performed by the 16th Amendment. 
Um, it's a privately held corporation. Uh, the people who own the Federal Reserve are not disclosed. The chairman of the Fed is a, politically, is a political appointment, and one of their jobs is to set the cost of money when, when lent to federally insured banks. Uh, I believe that's the answer you're looking for. Um, the issue with the Fed and why it's so dangerous is when you have a, a regulatory agency that can set the cost of money, therefore basically determine the value of everyone's savings, home, and, and personal sense of wealth, is that it gets manipulated. Now, for example, there's a reason why money is free to banks. Because if there was any sort of interest, our national debt would be huge. It would be bigger than it is, and it would grow faster than it is. And they're keeping it artificially low for that reason. We're on a trajectory right now of debt. It's a roller coaster. And what happens on the other side of that roller coaster is something this world has never seen. Well, it, it has a little bit. Germany was a, was a great example of World War II. Uh, they used to change the value of money every three hours to the point where they had to pay people every three hours so they can go and try to buy things before the money became useless. And the best example I heard was two women had two laundry baskets full of cash, German marks, and they went to buy something. And they wanted to go to the store and, and see what they wanted to buy, so they left their laundry baskets full of cash out on the sidewalk. And they came back, and you know what happened? Someone stole the laundry baskets. It, it's a true story. They were worth more than the cash. So the Fed is a very dangerous thing. If you want, well, we'll see what they can do with it. We may all collapse together as a country, um, but the Federal Reserve is something very dangerous, and it took a long time to get us here. It's going to take a long time to undo it, but what's most important is we're going to have to have some real, experienced fiscal leadership, and it certainly isn't the guy who used to work at Bask Baskin Robbins in Honolulu. It's not going to be him. I believe it was Henry Ford that said if the American people knew what the Federal Reserve was, there would be a revolution tomorrow morning. Yes? I have a question for both candidates, and I, I made some notes earlier, so please. How's that? There you go. I made some notes earlier, so please excuse if there's a little bit of a redundancy, but Matt Connolly earlier made a comment about welfare reform, welfare to work for, workfare. Good idea. And as Ronnie stated earlier, we small government Tea Party people hold candidates to a higher standard. So for both of you, if elected, would you support, if not initiate, legislation that significantly hinder, if not completely shut down, both the EPA and the Department of Education? Yes, yes, and uh, yes. Okay, two, yeah, two huge steps in the right direction to get our nation back to constitutional government as, as our founding fathers had in mind. Also, and backing up what you mentioned about a flat tax, I would, I would believe in a 10% federal consumption tax uh, to gradually replace and eliminate the income tax. Stop punishing those of us who choose to work and rewarding those who choose to be on welfare. Um, and the only other thing I would want to say to you is you might want to rethink that term limits thing. I, I understand that once good people get in there and you could really make a difference, that's, that's you know, you can make a difference, that's important. But on, in the grand scheme of things, we need the, pe the people to have control over the government rather than the other way around. That's right. you, mean, do you mean my term limits thing? Yes. Okay, I, I'm just not going to pledge anything like that. I, look, let me win one election first, okay, please? I've never won one. I've won a bunch of primaries, never won an election. So let me, I don't know what it's even like to go there. And I would imagine the first, the, the, what they say, the first term, you don't do anything. You basically get coffee for the people who know what's going on, and you find yourself around the office in the, in the hallways. So I just don't want to make a pledge. I'll pledge to never vote for raising taxes. I'll pledge for that. But I, but as far as term limits, you know, I, I just would rather not pledge than do anything else. Uh, you had another good point about um, the, the flat the flat tax, the consumption tax. I'm really concerned about any time the federal government is allowed to put on a federal tax on anything. That was one of the reasons I didn't support Herman Cain. The 999, the last nine was the um, federal sales tax of 9%. But, you know, he tried to put some teeth in it, and I give him credit for it, that to change it, uh, it would have to be, what, three quarters of both houses would have to vote to, to increase the tax. Well, to go back to Randy's question about uh, the Fed, part of the, the 16th Amendment also was the installation of the federal income tax. It used to be that a person's labor was their own, and no one could tax that labor. Well, the 16th Amendment changed that. 
Do you know what the, what the federal income tax highest bracket was in 1913? 7%. Within 20 years, it was over 50%. The federal government is addicted to spending, okay? We do not have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. And until we can get people to understand that we're already taxed to death, I mean, one of the questions that came up in the other debate was about uh, capital gains. And when you realize if you pay 25% as your federal tax, you're probably going to pay 10% as your state tax. You're going to have property tax. That's another 7% of your income. You're going to buy things at the store. It's another 6%. When it's all said and done, you might have 40 cents of whatever you earned that year for every dollar. So to change things, we need to revamp the system. I completely agree. We need to bring it down a lot more simply, get rid of a lot of loopholes. But the problem is, the government buys votes. With every time they change the tax laws, they're buying votes from one group or another, or they're raising money from one group or another. So it's gonna be a difficult thing, and I'm not, I'm not a one, one size fits all kind of guy. It's gonna be tough. It took 100 years to get us here. It's gonna take us not that long to undo it because we're gonna have some real, we're gonna be facing some real change. There's gonna be some real revolt or some real collapse. But I'm with you on a, on a simple solution. I just don't think a federal tax is something I wanna to go to. And, and I would agree uh, against the federal tax. It, it, it's too easy for them to, to say, you know, we, we had uh, issues going on, we're going to need to increase it 1% and, and continues to go up. But we need to keep, this, keep the simple plan that we have now, you know, eliminate the loopholes that only benefit the few, lower the tax rates for, for every American so we can keep more of our money and spend it how we want to. And, and I think that's the way to go. Yes, Bill. A uh, couple of weeks ago, I had a... Um, letter printed in the morning call about money and politics. And I think this is an answer to you to the uh, uh, term limits thing. I propose to have a state amendment limit where you can get your funds from. You cannot get them from George Soros or any of those kind of guys from other states. It limits you to be able to get money strictly from the citizens of the state of Pennsylvania. You can't get them from unions, you can't get them from PACs, you can't get them from the... the
federal parties, only the state party uh, takes all the rest of it out of there. You raise your money from the people in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and that way, what does somebody in Texas or some other place that wants to give money to a candidate up here know about the state of Pennsylvania? Uh, that's for all state and federal senators and, and representatives that come from the state of Pennsylvania. Just because you're going running for the Senate down there or the, or the representative down there, you're still a, a Pennsylvania citizen. And I want you to get your money from the people within this room and, and the rest of the counties around here and stay away from the big bucks, which then, well, uh, not one other thing, you talked about uh, redistricting. Uh, how's that working out for Harry Reid and John Boehner and the rest of them? Those are the guys that never get redistricted. They've got 70 or 80 percent Republicans and Democrats in their districts, and they're not getting redistricts because they go hand in hand together down the aisle of the money men. Yeah, and I agree with you with the funds, and I think if you look at my account, you know, there's no big unions or anything supporting my campaign. Well, the thing is, um, we, we can max out at $2,500, and I, I do agree with your point that we should get all of our money from the people in this room, so I'll be at the end of the door when the night's over. Um, no, and I agree with you, but what, what that will happen then is it will then bias elections. If Matt Cartwright can spend three hundred and ninety thousand, he his initial deposit in his account was three hundred ninety thousand bucks. I can't write that. Um, I could write it out of Stan's account, but I can't write it out of mine. Um, no, but but I, but I hear you on that. You know, the money money in politics, money is a lifeblood of politics, and it, it is it is. Well, we, unless you want publicly financed elections, which would probably mean you'd have a bunch of people who are completely unqualified, even more qualified than what we have in there now. It's difficult. It also, but the way I look at it, it sort of tests your metal. If you, you know, calling donors, and the, when I, to my uh, comment to Ronnie earlier, I've got a lot of donors who said, Matt, just win the primary. Win the primary, and believe me, you're going to have plenty of money. But they want to make sure that I'm going to step up with my own door knocking, phone calling, being on the radio, showing up at places like this. They're going to make me earn the primary victory, and then they're going to award me with donations. But as far as unions and things like that, I think they're, they can do their own PACs, but they can't communicate with the candidate. And the Citizens United uh, decision by the Supreme Court is something that, you know, speed, money equals speech. Okay, it's not a perfect system, but we're going to have to work within it. Yes, my dear. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, how come we always hear about Social Security veteran benefits running out, but not where welfare? <laughs> Mom made me do it. Oh, no, don't blame your mom. Um, welfare benefits will never run out because that's they're never going to stop buying votes, right? Isn't that what it comes down to, is the buying vote? And to get to your point about welfare, uh, I mean, the Veterans Administration, if you want to see what Obamacare is going to become, look no further than the VA. The way they handled those people in Phoenix was absolutely sinful. That woman who manipulated the appointments in order to get her bonus, what do you think, that times that by the rest of the country, and that's going to be Obamacare. It, it's going to be a disaster. The welfare thing, when, when Obama got rid of the work aspect of welfare, he just guaranteed a whole new voter block who was never going to bite the hand that feeds them. It's that simple. The money will always be there for welfare, and the media is going to be on their side. And he's actually right for, for the welfare. You know, especially as long as liberals in there, they're, they're going to keep pushing that agenda because that gets them reelected each time. And, and as for veterans, we need to provide all the support we can for them. It's like one percentage of the population that fights for the rights of the rest of us. And so. One thing, if we're gonna ever have to go to war, there's three things that I would ever have to, to, to get my vote and for congressional approval for it, is that A, is there immediate danger for us or, or an ally of ours? The second thing is, do we have a plan? Do we have an entry plan to, to get into war? Do we, we have the plan that provides all our soldiers the, the services and tools that they need to accomplish that goal and to get back out? And the third part is that we have the, the plan in place when they come back home. You know, going around through this and knocking on doors, I, I met an Iraq war veteran who after years of anguish of going through PTSD, he went into the emergency room up in Wilkesboro 
And they said, you need to see a psychologist, you know, once every two or three weeks. And they said, we can get you in once every two or three months. So he had to travel all the way to New Jersey to, to get the help that he needed. And that's unacceptable. You know, our, our soldiers are, are risking their lives for us. First of all, we need a foreign policy that doesn't require so many boots and, and, and soldiers, women's lives on, on the line overseas. But we need to make sure we have something in place for them. You know, them to come serve for us and come back and be in a waiting line is unacceptable. And uh, so we need to make sure up more, up first more that they, uh, the resources are there for them. Yes, sir, you have a mic. Yes, uh, I don't know if you ever, uh, Matt's are aware that the, uh, it is on, the thing. Up, there you go. Okay, here we have <laughs> Okay, well, phone commercial. Uh, the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau supports the cheap labor of immigrant workers, and they're trying, they're pushing hard for the uh, nationalization uh, of immigrants uh, for work status or whatever. Uh, how would you combat something like that for, to both of you, Matt? And if I could say one thing about the, say one thing about the money coming in from other states, I send money to other candidates all over the country. If I see a congressman or a senator that's going to support my values and, and win in another state, I want to be able to support them because that's my free speech. Okay, thank you. Um, the thing about the cheap labor, well, you know, it, it's almost uh, one of those things. If it's an unenforced rule and they let the workers work under the table, they're already violating federal laws. We have the E-Verify. It's just like the marijuana thing, you know. It's still a federally illegal situation to have anyone buying or consuming marijuana in any state, yet the Obama administration has chosen to look the other way. Uh, when it comes to cheap labor, well, that's why they want them. But why can't, you know, if we've got all these, these people on welfare, why can't they be working at the farms? I mean, honestly, how many of us didn't grow up learning how to work at the lowest job possible? Nothing is for free in this world. And I don't know why people don't have the gall, the guts, the gumption to go and say, hey, look, if you're getting a check for sitting home and we've got vacancies that illegal immigrants are taking, why shouldn't they be working? It, it, it's really a basic thing in life, but no one has the guts to say it. Yeah, we definitely need to enforce the E-Verify and hold everyone accountable. Not only the McDonald's and, and all that, but even our, our farmers, who I, I definitely sympathize, sympathize with, but we need to uh, hold them accountable as well. So we need to work on the visa program so that we can have legally documented workers in here that can compete for the jobs with the rest of us. Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, uh, and uh, Pappy's kind of skipped on this a little bit. That's actually for both of you. Uh, you mentioned uh, supporting the military with uh, the best equipment, making sure we had the right number of boots on the ground if, if necessary. So what I've seen, and I'm sure many of us here have seen, we have not gone into anything in the past dozen years, actually probably the past 20 years, with an absolute plan to win. You should never go into a military conflict without the intention of winning. Would you ever? And I mean decisively win. Would you ever support any military action that did not have that plan before going in? You know, you make an excellent point. Why are the Japanese and the Germans have the relationship that they have with us? Because we really beat them, and they know it. It's true. If you, want to, if you want to think of where should the safest place in the world should be, it should be uh, Jerusalem, Israel, right? Because of all those peace treaties. Shouldn't that be the safest place ever? They sign peace treaties every other day, I think twice on Sunday. But no, because no, one, no one's allowed to finish the conflict, okay? Not that I want war there, but we got to realize what we have as a commander in chief, we have a guy who thinks he's so awesome and he's such a wonderful, brilliant person that he's going to show up and they're going to say, we bow to your awesomeness, we'll all behave while you're here. That, no, that's what the guy thinks. He doesn't realize, that. why, why do you think Vladimir, Vladimir Putin has taken Barack Obama's man card and shredded it? He has turned that guy into a little wuss, not that he wasn't already. And I, I mean, I respect the office, I really do. I, I'm sorry, I do not respect the man, I can't. Oh, oh, Putin, why, Putin has a, a long-term view of things, okay? Like most people who are successful, and he's been successful for many years, he has a 10 or 20 year vision. 
The Obama administration can only rule by crisis. Everything's a crisis, and then he'll make something red line. Ooh, geez, they crossed that red line. They weren't supposed to. I'm so awesome. Um, and they do it, and then nothing happens. And then Putin says, well, after these Olympics, watch this. Into, into the Crimea he goes. Oh, Obama's like, oh, you know, you really shouldn't do that. And I was on the phone with him for 90 minutes. Hey, Barry, you should have been on the phone with 90 seconds, okay? It should have been a real short conversation, and you should have done all the talking and followed up with actions, but he didn't do it. Now Russia is occupying parts of Ukraine. What's going to happen to Lithuania? What's going to happen to the rest? Putin has said he wants to reassemble the Soviet Union. And with a guy like Obama, it's, he's going to do it without firing a single shot. So I completely agree with your point about if you're going to, if you're going to go to go war, if you're going to have a military action, you've got to do it to win. Otherwise, what's the point? You're just wasting good ammo. And I will fight for more congressional approval, you know, and say these military actions and that, make it a, a declaration of war so that the, the congressmen are accountable to it. So that way we will look at every avenue possible because we'll need to go back and talk to our constituents and say why we voted for or against it. Right now, they're allowed to go ahead and do, you know, police actions, anything short of, of declaring war on their own without any kind of approval. We need to change that so that we can get more of the congressmen involved so that they can look at other resources and find other ways around it. But then if we need to go, we need to make sure we give all of our soldiers every avenue, every weapon or, or tool that they need to complete that job. You know, when we bought the, the, dropped the bombs on Hiroshima there, you know, we, we killed uh, millions of people, but we saved hundreds of millions of lives because it was decisive and ending and everyone knew, all right, you know, we really need to, to scale back and sit back and look at this. And that's the new way we've got to handle any conflict. If, it, if it's going to require boots on the ground or, or risking any of our soldiers, women, and lives, we, we need to uh, be decisive with it. <laughs> yep, bring it back. <sighs> yes. Um, I've been, as all of us, been watching and listening to these gentlemen. And uh, as far as it goes, well, I'm thinking that everybody sounds really good in the beginning, but as time goes on and when they get elected, then they start to change and they become very progressive. And I'm just kind of wondering, is that going to happen to any of you guys? <laughs> Are you sure? That's like yes, the fox said, they will eat the chickens. <laughs> yes, Robbie. Oh, uh, somebody. Yeah, anyway. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is something that's been going on for a long until and just recently I thought about it, how stupid it is is that when legislation is put together then it grows and grows and grows with a lot of nonsense that we, we are we're stupid the other, the other thing is uh, the Speaker of the House has the uh, power to not let a bill come to the surface for a vote so if so it, it becomes a lopsided uh, four years or whatever, however that uh, Congress uh, is, happens to be in it. The Speaker of the House, can, uh, that's a stupid rule. <laughs> Couldn't be any dumber. Same, same. Okay, so apparently you don't really have an opinion on this right now. Um, the, the thing about the, uh, about the amendments and things like that, once again it comes to vote, vote buying. Um, th these guys are attaching things on, they've got their lobbyists to serve that sort of thing. I think, I, I, one of my big things, people say they want to go to Washington and get things done. I want to go to Washington and get things undone because we have so many rules. They pile on top of each other and pile off to each other. One thing I would like to do, and this might change things, this would have been really helpful with Obamacare. For every page of a bill, there has to be a 20 minute period for which they can have to read it before it can be voted on. Because you know these guys don't go, go, go read this stuff, right? When you get a 20, you know, 2800 page bill. By that time, people will actually read it, and I say, wait, what is this? What is this? What is this? Then they might not get the votes for it. So I hear you there. As far as the speaker uh, not bringing certain things up, well, what they're doing is they're protecting their members in their majority caucus so they don't have to show that they voted one way or the other because they might be for something but their voters wouldn't like it. They might be against it and they'll get lambasted in the media if they're against it. It's, it's how the game's played. I mean, I wish, I wish there was a perfect solution. Uh, but it's the one we have, and we kind of have to work within it. I was, I was going to say, on the, if, the, uh, if we, the uh, general public could vote that particular part of it, what you're, what you're talking about, we would stop it. 
Well, we have a, a, a democratic republic. We don't have a democracy. So we elect people to then vote yeah. for us. So that's the difference. So the first step is to get rid of all those pages that are in a bill is we need to get Cartwright out of there because he's another lawyer in there and that's how we get up all these long bills that are so hard to read and understand. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, that's, that's the first step there. And the, uh, um, what was the second part of your question? Uh, the other part was uh, the Amendment. Speaker of the House having, uh, trapping uh, legislation from coming to the surface. And, and that really comes from some groups like this. You guys writing letters in, you know, to, to the speaker, writing it into every House member that's in there and, and voicing it. I mean, just like we're doing with the Second Amendment here. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's the interaction of the public that puts pressure on them to make them bring it to the floor. You know, if, if we can get whatever, you know, whatever uh, body that they're sitting in, in in their district, put pressure on them to say, hey, hold them accountable. You know, we have a, a question. We need something voiced. Ronnie has it. What will be our last question? I have a comment and a question. I'm holding an absentee ballot, and we've been having a lot of trouble getting voter ID in Pennsylvania. Absentee ballots also a problem because it can be uh, defrauded. Um, would both of you work at the federal level to push a national ID card for voting? And one comment for Connolly. Um, I know that this, this is a grind about the term limits, but what you said about let me win an election, that's kind of like what Nancy Pelosi said about let's pass it before we read it. Oh, Ronnie, you got me. Uh, look, I just don't want to make a pledge on something I don't know. Like, let's say after two limits, I'm like, these guys are crazy. I'd rather drive a race car. Would that make you happy? Because um, driving a race car guarantees me a lot more fun than, um, than, than being a congressman. Um, the federal ID, man, I don't, I'm not happy with the federal ID. Um, I think you have state IDs. Uh, the whole concept of the voter ID is such a no-brainer, but we all know why it's being fought. It's called voter fraud, and the Democrats are really good at it. Um, not that some doesn't have the Republican side, I'm sure it does, but when you've got divisions, 29 divisions in Philadelphia, not one vote for Romney, not even by mistake, that's called voter fraud. Um, but I don't like the federal ID thing. I mean, you might as well put a chip on our skin or give us a tattoo or something, so I'm not for that. And don't compare me to Nancy Pelosi, please. <laughs> I would have to agree. No national ID. I mean, that's something we should be fighting against. But yes, a voter ID, and the states have been real, you know, liberal on what they'll accept for, it, and it should pass. You know, a driver's license or the ID, you know, college or student ID, and the states even offered to provide the ID that you know they require for for voting. We need it for everything else we do in our lives, and to uh, do something as important as voting, uh, I think it should be, you know, you should be able to be held accountable for. It. Well, I would like to thank both of these candidates for their, their time and their efforts. And I'd like to thank the whole group for their great questions. Did we have a good, good forum? Did we enjoy it? That's what it's all about. Thank you. Your side's over here. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming the two candidates. They both have yard signs on the side there. They both need money, as I mentioned. Um, I'd encourage you all to go to those reports. Fish around on the websites and see what you can find. That information is important and we need to know what we're, what we're up against in the fall. Uh, folks, this is the time. The next 15 minutes is for you. I'd like to ask all the board members, Dave, you can stay where you are, all the executive board members to come up front. Uh, we're going to open the floor to questions for the board members about the group. All the board members that are present come up front. While they're making their way up front, I want to mention that we do have absentee ballot applications in the back. Also, the lending library. We're still looking for a volunteer to take over the duties of the lending library. Next month, starting next month, there will be a general suggestion box that will be sealed uh, back on the support the troops table. So with that,